Hello everyone, today we talk about the Magyars and the origins of Hungary, a topic that we never quite addressed as such. We talked about the second invasions during the 10th century, we looked at the Latin Germanic reaction to the latter Magyar uh, invasions of Germany, of, of Italy, I mean they arrived uh, even up to Spain, uh, telling the truth in France as well. Um, but and we also made actually certain videos about uh, video comparisons really between uh, the uh, central European monarchies of Poland, Bohemia and Hungary and observing the similarities in the development of these monarchic systems right? that actually had a lot in common starting just if anything from a demographic environmental point of view pre-existing infrastructural situation um, and also naturally an exposition to, to the waves of um, Eastern, of Eurasian peoples, let's say, coming from the steppes, which actually, uh, what we'll see today in the area, had always been a thing, it would continue to be so, right? The, the Magyars are not the, definitely the first, not the, the last people coming from, from the East, settling uh, in, in this area. Um, and there is in fact a lot of continuity, right? The, the Kingdom of Hungary, uh, as it forms, uh, today we'll see from the principi the grand, so-called Grand Principality, um, will keep f fundamentally welcoming, at least especially the monarchy that had quite specific political goals in, you know, domestic affairs to, to counter, for example, the push of the ethnic nobility to, to settle peoples like the Cumans, right? For example, to even maintain a particular lifestyle that was somewhat militarized rather than entailed different, you know, political relations um, as well. Um, and this has to do with, you know, the, the history of Central and Eastern Europe in, in many ways. Um, if looking at, look at Sarmatism of the Polish Slakto, the same Turanism of the, of the uh, Hungarian nobility, right? This idea that somewhat, you know, these peoples were fundamentally unique to their own context, right? Think about the the Hungarians that, yeah, speak uh, an Ugrofinic language, and but they are, of course, the, the result of, you know, as we'll see today, of uh, Slavic, Germanic, and definitely this Ugrofinic element that blended together, and also previous groups, naturally, that or that also came or, or uh, had already been there. And, and this is um, an important uh, element to, to underline if one wants to understand the true nature of the Magyar dominion and in many ways also the one of the Kingdom of Hungary that actually was stressed in the other videos. I mean, the idea that this was not really uh, a, just a kingdom, right? It was probably somewhat like an empire, right? It, it, it was enormous, territorially speaking, and it came to dominate fundamentally uh, the neighboring populations to the Pannonian Plains in a in fact, an imperial-like system, right? If you look at the, some of the titles of the Hungarian king, that you, you find this, uh, you know, endless amount of, of localities of peoples, etc. Because objectively, much of the um, political and institutional models of the great uh, lordships of, of the steppes were functional to the strengthening of. Of, of a territorialized, uh, sedentary domain like the one that the Magyars uh, had uh, unavoidably tra transformed into. And, and this character is, um, is fascinating to assess because, first of all, this is not a terribly, you know, documented area in Europe, right? It, you know that Hungary, just as Bohemia or Poland, um, come to, to gravitate on, on the long run. Uh, maybe Hungary less than the, definitely less than the others, actually, but in, in the Germanic orbit. Right, they they Hungary has very important ties with Constantinople, and and far beyond. Right, because there is even a Middle Eastern channel that has to do with the Silk Road, with the, with the Black Sea, the you know the Balkan route. That um, even the origin of the Magyar people seems to have been a, a very important thing. Right, especially if you study. Uh, Hungarian military history. We made a, a video actually on the Hungarian night of the 13th century. So the moment in which you know the the ethnic element of the Magyars had been somewhat mm, re you know adapted or diluted, and you you see a full Western let's say Frankization in, in military um, you know in, in military model the Hungarian knights right and and this was functional naturally to also to the structuring of the kingdom that definitely was not modeled through mostly like, like a step, uh, you know, imitation, but on the contrary, it grew 
as futile as you know thing went on right today we stop today we will focus chiefly to the period of settlement of the Magyars to yeah we'll deal with, even with the kingdom of Hungary we'll look at Stephen uh, the Great and uh, the the generally speaking what you know what's the legacy that objectively managed to to create the kingdom as such so we will arrive barely to to the Mongol invasion but you know that uh, the Arpads went extinct uh, like this old other great dynasties of uh, the Central European people such as like uh, the Premislis in Bohemia or the, or the Piasts in, in, in Poland and that were eventually you know substituted by other dynasties Hungary uh, became Angevin as you know um, and that strengthened further uh, further the the westernization of the political military models. I mean, the, the Hungary that arrives at the, you know, the eve of the Ottoman conquest is one of the major powers in, in probably in Western Europe, right? Uh, if we want to, to use here the, the adjective Western in this, you know, kind of sense of the, the Frankish, eman the emanation of the Frankish model that had basically overrun Europe by the, by the 13th century, right? Even, you know, Look at what happened to Constantinople in 1204 and how the, the, the Frankish model spread f far across, even in the Islamic world, by, in, by influence, right? Cultural influence and models. But this is another, yet another topic. Um, but of course, the, the kingdom in itself retained uh, in its complexity and in its articulation a lot of very fascinating ethnic characters that you can observe in, in those, especially in those video comparisons we made in, in, the, in the video on the 13th century Hungarian night, uh, but that will come back on uh, frequently because there is there's much to say about this system. It was pretty damn big, right? It stretched, you know, it, it arrived up into full Central Europe, the gates of Germany, on the Adriatic Sea, uh, on the Danube, the Byzantine frontier, and the Black Sea, in, in Russia, actually, the Principality of Alex, where it was even at some point, um, you know, dominated. Uh, and and therefore we have a, a multitude of uh, even of external influences that kept pouring here and and modeling the same kingdom. And, and much of this process, however, had its origins, of course, from a political institutional point of view, in in the very settlement of the Major people in the Pannonian Plain. And today we will cover this topic in a very sketchy, general, introductive, but not superficial and incomplete way, but at least to fix, try to fix the, you know, the most important dynamics of, of this phenomenon. So uh, this is, first of all, to be contextualized in centuries that um, so, um, of course, much more, and in even around the same area in, in Central Europe and in the Balkans, the creation within the two uh, great Christian empires, the, the Holy Roman Empire and, and the Byzantine Empire, um, certain important political ecclesiastical constructions, uh, especially in the Slavic countries, right, that also uh, Hungary technically was before the Magyars settled in, but also the Pannonian Plain, but at that time, you know, if it was not properly Slavic, it was, it was at least heavily Slavicized, right, and the, the relation here between the ethnicities is very is very important um, and that uh, you know involved definitely also the this process of transition of the uh, major uh, military people because this is essentially what they were at the beginning towards uh, a similar uh, systematization this is really uh, uh, a, a leitmotif of, of, of the whole era, right? If you were to, to tell about the history of, of Russia, of Bohemia, of Poland, of Hungary, or even of Bulgaria, we, we essentially talk about this. We, we talk about um, wide areas of Central, uh, Southern, even in Eastern Europe that went through a structure of political and administrative structures that had been previously unknown, right? Here we are still in a turbulent time, right? The, the, the hungers are the same part of the second invasion we were calling before. So we are uh, in a moment in which much has to be, you know, uh, first of all, stamped in order to be controlled uh, and eventually even dominated by a certain standard. Uh, and to frame, however, finally, within the structures of civilization that pass through the uh, establishment of a central government, of an ecclesiastical, hierarchy of a proper territorialization 
of the political control, right? A districtuation, a you know, with a tax mm, system, therefore giving birth to finally a, a stable entity that these parts of Europe had fundamentally never seen, right? Because they, they were had been inhabited since antiquity exclusively by tribes that were constantly either you know, fighting, of course, each other all, all the single from from day uh, to to night, but um, also creating very ephemeral and kind of confederative uh, powers that you know came and and, and went as um, as this of the major movements of peoples or at least the movements of the greater empires actually dictated in many ways and and there is this picture we have to to have clear in mind of naturally the the, the Frankish dominated area uh, in, in a broader sense here we talk about Frankish we don't mean exactly the Franks as such but you know now they, what the Carolingian Empire fundamentally established um, as a political institutional administrative social system and and the Roman Empire and Byzantine Empire um, in the East right as these major centers let's say of broader you know organization that were fundamentally also of ecclesiastical nature right uh, the Church of Rome at this point with and and one of Constantinople were fundamentally clashing uh, one against the other um, to to win these pagan populations that still you know existed in this enormous area actually of Europe that had remained fundamentally uncontaminated by this different forms you know of, of worldview of, of political and social organization because up to that point they never had had the the means and the reasons to to, to try to build something greater so naturally this process is a path uh, of aristocracy right the the emergence of these monarchies is uh, in a way the you know the the denial of the previous let's say let's call it democratic as if you know, there was nothing uh, even comparable to to what we think it's democracy uh, in the tribal world but um it was fundamentally based on a oligarchic egalitarianism right the idea that basically that there hadn't to be a king over all the others because the all the other aristocrats because this would have been you know uh, going against the uh, the older traditions of the fact that telling the truth you know those oligarchs have stepped you know, in the sense over the rights of, of all the other freemen that were now essentially working for them in a you know increasingly stratified society, um, but that were concurring at the same time to create a monarchy on their own. So this path is very interesting, especially uh, with the Majors, that um, compared to, in fact, as we were saying before, these this other entities like um, you know uh, Poland or Bohemia that were Slavic, but even the the, the Bulgars that were, were Turkic but became Slavs fundamentally, in, in, uh, culturally speaking, right? Whereas the, the Magyars did not, right? Because, yeah, there is much of Slavic in, in Hungarian culture, undeniably. But, of course, um, for reasons that we, we don't explain thoroughly and that have to do probably, however, with the repetition of the settlement of the steppes peoples um, in, in the Pannonian plain proper, maintained actually their proper major character and that they shared a bit I must say would be if anything with the Bulgarians because the, the Bohemians and, and the Poles were somewhat more they had more the, the kind of you know emergency from the from from the bottom the same ethnic Slavic aristocracy right whereas you know the, the Bulgars had created fundamentally a uh, a parallel empire to Constantinople that they also saw as a sharing in the same universal empire right because here there is not a real uh, national connotation to empires. These are all universal entities. So t technically, everybody can uh, share this divine power that exists, uh, you know, all over the, the world in this regard. Like the great Eurasian warlords are reasoning in this regard in the same exact way, uh, you know, a Byzantine emperor would, or even Charlemagne would, in the sense that you know, if power exists here on earth, it's because of the great uh, god. A uh, given um, a right to rule, one through virtue, through you know this military promise, right? And, and the Majors come objectively straight from uh, you can say the steppes, right? Because the Majors technically are this Ugrophinic people, seemingly originating not in the steppes area proper, but rather in the forests, originally speaking, the, oh, no, the you know forest band to, or slightly towards the north, in this area. Uh, fundamentally uh, between the the Urals and Caucasus that 
um, eventually began to, to approach uh, the, the West in uh, you know in, in uh, and stepizing al along the way, right? Um, especially because of Khazar influence and passing readily to the through the Ukraine and gathering other peoples, also different ethnicity. For example, the, the same term Hungar seems to have derived from the ten arrows that symbolized ten tribes, only seven of which were Ugrophinic and three were Turkic, right? And all kind of emancipating from the Khazar domination and, you know, exiting its orbit. That came to to you know to interfere with with Europe um, because of the realization of that this weak area fundamentally of Pannonia at that time um, presented for them many important um, you know opportunities potential um, definitely because Pannonia uh, when the Magyars arrived uh, was inhabited after so many invasions on the, in the regions of the Middle Danube by nomadic or semi-nomadic peoples coming from uh, the east or the north, by a rather scarce uh, population of Slavs and Slavicized others, right, that was politically uh, in this huge frontier area uh, between, um, you know, the, the domination or influence, let's say better, of the Bavarians, of the Moravians, and of the Bulgarians that were all in contrast with each other. And there was you know, these are big spaces, right? Um, there is not um, a true center in the middle. One may ask, you know, what would have happened if, you know, the Magyars had not settled in this area? The, the Magyar migration triggered, for example, the split um, of the of, of the Slavs into the southern Slavs, for example, and western Slavs, uh, as they basically cut out the, you know, the, this broader Slavic or Slavicized area in the middle that connected the, the Balkans with uh, with Central Europe um, and establishing a domination on their own. Do you know that the, the, the Pannonian uh, plain had been seat of the great uh, Avar Khaganate that however had gone to, uh, during the, the 6th century that however had declined uh, up during the following centuries uh, up to the destruction by, by the hands of Charlemagne in, in, the, in the, nine, the beginning of the 9th and um, and this area had remained at, at the outskirts of the Saint Carolingian Empire. Uh, this time was, was you know was didn't exist anymore. As such was all split, um, and uh, and therefore in, and also in this you know f fairly away from the Bulgarian power was also the closer uh, to it in, in in the south right that had already its own problems. Where you know, with the Byzantine frontier mostly, but also trying to expand in the Carpathian Basin, in you know, especially towards the mines, uh, the same ones that the Romans had looked uh, in, for in, in Dacia when they conquered that. Um, and now the Magyars entered to, to fill this gap. There was a pretty imposing one. There was actually also very well suited uh, environmentally for their for their fierce cavalry, right, that they had began to, to develop as, you know, uh, especially in a predatory fashion, typically military uh, character of the steppes, right? You know the the Magyars we had had this this passage, right? That we had transformed from livestock breeders into a people of warriors by vocation, right? There, there is this reality uh, out there. Even the steppes world is not is not all alike. Uh, there are properly nomadic peoples. There are semi nomadic people. There are even sedentary peoples, and not all of them uh, achieve you know the same level of you know mm, of dynamism and um, uh, aggressivity, we could say, and, and this military um, and expansionistic mindset and ambitions like the Majors do, right? So their adventure is uh, witnessing definitely something that we, we don't m much get from the sources because, of course, these peoples were fundamentally literate or barely, I mean, yeah, there were inscriptions, things like this, but, you know, a completely different relation with, with you know, Britain culture. Uh, bro, you know, uh, meant in comparison to, to the West, for example. Um, and, and we don't get the fact, and this is something at least I'm fairly convinced of, is that these peoples had actually a pretty crystalline clear idea of what was happening in a sedentary world, right? Because, of course, the, the movements of, of, of these peoples were gradual, right? They took they took years. There is all a controversy in saying, you know, when, when did actually the Magyars migrate um, in, in Pannonian base? It was it, you know, the last decade of, of the ninth century or even later, right? And there were 
properly actually groups that moved in, in different times and that the word naturally very careful about what we're doing because the situation was transforming from a day to another but it's obvious that you know having the vision the, the, the you know the, the awareness the, the 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 mindset open to to moving right to go search for something else that is naturally different compared to to what the, the place of origin really is yeah because the the Hungarian pusta is, is really steps like the the steps in Europe begin begin in, in Hungary but they um, they're still in, in a surrounded by very different contexts and at this point you know having you know to deal with fairly well structured neighbors especially when you take uh, I don't know the the Germans or the Byzantines, right? And and therefore there is a capacity to say, okay, let's exploit this situation, um, and let's see what can how we can push this forward. And we we all know what the uh, the Magyars were capable of doing in this regard uh, during the 10th century. I mean, the raids they launched, as we were saying before, in Western Europe were far and deep, right? They arrived, they stretched from from uh, from northern Germany to southern Italy to um, northern Spain and and all the, the Loire Valley and, and even beyond so uh, basically covering an astonishing uh, uh, amount of, of territory right these raids were today we will not concentrate on them because actually we will have uh, time and hopefully at least you know a chance to, to, to dedicate at least um, more dedicated video properly to the to the major invasion, the, the, in the sense of the major raids all over Europe, that were something also strategically extremely fascinating that uh, triggered a lot of response and a lot of organization, also in, in, in this area of Western Europe, um, that had to deal now with the renewed uh, threat posed by you know, other populations. Look at what the Ottonians uh, have achieved in order because they were entrusted by the Eastern Frankish nobility the command of of the kingdom military force to to counter the uh, the hungers right so this is a very delicate moment in Europe where really a, a lot the 10th century is one of the single most defining moments in western history in terms of literally the, the basis of what we will know eventually as as the ancien regime but also you know i mean not in the negative you know enlightenment perspective you know being properly in the actually solid and, and gluing capability of the latin germanic elites to, to form a, a response to even to this uh, threats but also actually to, to the more loosely to the, the, the broader instability that the same wars had trumped themselves in since you know the collapse of the Carolingian Empire right um, and that we're able at the end of this phase actually to to absorb the same margins within their own within their own system right within their own secular and ecclesiastical policy the vassalitic beneficiary system the, this other um, you know broader elements as we'll see the the arpads the the, the ruling dynasty the you know the, the late uh, you know of the at least of the so the, the period of so-called of the grand principality of hungary and is the one that precedes essentially uh you know traditionally either december the 25th uh, year 1000 or january the 1st 1001 it is the crowning of istvan stephen uh of hungary stephen saint proper Right, yeah. Hungary is founded with a with a, a saint king, and th that that's extremely important. It makes it one of the greatest, uh, you know, points of reference for seeing Christianity, and that remains one of the most defining and important um, moments in in the history, uh, in European history. Simply because you know, think about Hungary. They could have leaned more towards Constantinople, for example. They might have. You know, chosen other paths. The, the the process of you know the monarchic transformation might have failed. Um, uh, lots of things might have gone astray from that. The same Germans at some point try to even extend its control in Hungary. They uh, there is there are many threats posed to 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 this uh, newborn uh, entity that instead is able to structure itself and to place it to frame itself in a in a very specific position and uh, growing and increasing match its own ties with chiefly with Germany, with Italy, with France, this these countries that, as we will see now, also will provide this dramatic amount of, of personnel, uh, military, ecclesiastical, uh, that would help to, to structure the same um, Hungarian kingdom, 
right? Because the difficulties in this area was were were high, right? The the, the Pannonian Basin wasn't such, you know, uh, terrific land to you know to, to start building something so solid and robust, like you know the, the era had never seen. But fundamentally, certain predatory states, since the the Huns, the the Avars, right? These were areas were fine for keeping to to live uh, kind of semi nomadic lifestyle. And in part, Hungary also retained. Especially through the as we were saying before, this reinjection of nomadic element every once in a while from from the east, um, but that effectively managed to, to to be achieved, and that actually the the Ottoman conquest destroyed in many ways. Just yesterday we were talking about, for example, how even a I don't know a military unit, one of the hussars, right in uh, just because of the collapse of the of the Hungarian state and in, in the strengthening of the Polish Lithuanian one in the early modern era produces in two countries respectively light cavalry and heavy cavalry because uh Hungary comes back to be a frontier once again. Not a not a solid power at that point. Uh while Poland Lithuania w went on even with its own limits, but also uh, you know with this robust uh you know power at least uh, leaving further. And there is naturally you, you understand how many implications here, and also the the memory. I, I don't know how much in popular culture, uh, in West in the Western world, you know, is really tributed to Hungary. Because as far as I'm concerned, it, it, you know, it's a very important chapter of European history. But I, I fear it's somewhat overlooked, and um, that's the reason why I would like to be careful and you know spot on in describing this process because I think it, it, it's of dramatic importance to to really understand um, and um, looking at the uh, at the Magyars right they entered in the Pannonian Basin uh, under the guide of the Prince Arpad right um, when they had already trans fully transformed in, in a warlike people right and launch starting to launch from their Pannonian base this astonishing amount of raids that witnessed naturally the the weakness also the frag chiefly the, the frag the, the fragmentation of uh, the Latin Germanic world after the collapse of the Carolingian Empire that rendered this broader area of Central and Western Europe permeable to these raids that were conducted like you know without a you know supply train a logistical train they were literally raids it was were sometimes also very autonomous um, uh, parties of major horsemen sustaining themselves just through loot, right? You know, you pass, you devastate these areas that were already suffering their own troubles between the Saracens and the Vikings, but, um, you know, they they made enormous tours, right, back and forth, and repeat uh, one time after time after time, right? The thing stopped mainly when the closer, you know, neighbors, and I would say, naturally, the, the stronger power was forming to, you know, in the area, in, in, in Central Europe, the one of, of Ottonian Saxony, managed to defeat them uh, in a series, actually, of battles. Um, there is, um, we try, but naturally, the, the main role to the Battle of Lechfeld in 955 by Otto I, this the Lech River is uh, you know close to to, to Augsburg in, in Bavaria. Uh, that, uh, however, is uh, if you want a product of Ottonian propaganda in historical perspective, in the sense that of course Lechfeld, Lechfeld was a great Ottonian victory. The the Magyars were were driven back at that point and shocked enough to start pondering the idea of you know changing lives and transforming into something else. Naturally. After you know already two or three generations of uh, settlement and you know you have transition from nomadic or semi-nomadic into somewhat sedentary lifestyle, things were changing. But for strict by themselves within these people, because after all, this is also what the the Avars had gone through fundamentally. Um, but from a strictly military point of view, we shouldn't. The, the great big, one of the greatest victory, of course, was of Riade by Henry the Fowler, uh, Otto um, the First's uh, father. In, in 933, but also a very um, overlooked role was the one of the Bavarians, probably of the parallel branch of the Ottonians that ruled in Bavaria. It was this great area, actually, you know, the Bavaria at the time was not the ones of today's uh, boundaries, like Bavaria was this great area that encompassed, you know, um, today's, uh, yeah, roughly Bavaria, in fact, but also Austria and northeastern Italy. It was a, a 
great, uh, a very, uh, a very large and somewhat also, you know, undefined in terms of frontiers uh, region that had to, to cope with this constant threat of the hungers were literally next door uh, and, uh, da and and therefore taking the brunt of their force mostly against themselves and but since this was the parallel line to the Ottonians it eventually you know achieved their Namatsu Imperi you know reclaimed themselves you know as high of you know universal Ro Christian Roman emperors etc you know they they shone with Otto the first and, and the defeat of the Lechfeld but you know were fundamentally obscured but actually the the Magyars suffered their own share of, of bloody defeats against the Bavarians and that contributed to erode uh, their their base. And um, as you know, war is uh, you know potentially one of the greatest destructors of cultures, but definitely also one of its most powerful hybridators. So already in these generations, the the Magyars had evidently looked uh, at typically the, the Eastern Frankish model that was tr transitioning into a uh, reviving better the, the, the properly the universal imperial the imperial one um, and also considering that Otto the first for example re annexed uh, Italy and changed you say tied it to the to the Germanic crown once again um, these were areas that naturally were like you know the first countries that they the the, the, the Magyars had found were going in the west and they were naturally more largely more advanced areas that, that they had their own right they had uh, these were, you know, Italy was an area of cities. Southern Germany was fairly, you know, well well built in its basalatic uh, institutions. So, uh, and they, they both the, the areas were growing, and uh, Hungary didn't have the same potential, and it had also to control this this broader area that within which lived also many peoples that, on the long run, were fundamentally uh, absorbing gradually the 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 same major element that was gradually sedentarizing right we don't know much even about the early uh, major settlement because when the the leaders it was as we've seen there were basically a confederacy they were all various tribes this is typical of the steps right there is a common name like 10 arrows that however tell you that yeah there were something different there were not one arrow like there were 10 different ones and this is the uh, aforementioned kind of egalitarian mindset of all the various chieftains that had joined together because you're know, in the steps if you don't do that you you do not survive um and had organized these raiding parties but you know settling uh each own in their own area right of of hungary and sometimes resettling right uh in other places like the, you know they the launched a raid from from a base then when they came back they settled in another um, in the process of sedentarization was very gradual, but it also showed definitely the the major chieftains what you know what advantage derived naturally from a much more lucrative lifestyle that was based not just on raiding, risking their lives in this you know sometimes literally thousand kilometers long journeys across Europe, raiding and pillaging, but you know starting to invest even all this loot in something more stable like you know fortifications you know extending. The control of on of the local peasantry that worked for them, and you know all the, the process that was in, already in a much more advanced fashion going on all over uh, post Carolingian Europe, and consolidating the very same powers that were defeating now the the Magyars. Um, so uh, think about the, the mineral resources of the area: uh, gold, silver, even salt. Um, you know. The, they their the Magyars are stationed on the Danube. That is one of the most single most important trade highways in in uh, in Eurasia. We could say because it's not literally just about Europe, right? You see, in in um, Magyar and later Hungarian military culture, we still see that these peoples were not were not at all. You know, the the, the brutes of, of the steppes never seen civilization. Did these guys had been exposed to a lot actually? of waves of um, of influences the, the same Khazars actually were something more advanced definitely in the steppe peoples we find a lot of middle eastern uh, military influence panoplies and even siege warfare capabilities even you know if you know uh, western sources describe the hungarians a bit like in this stereotypical way of the parthians uh, on a literary model saying you know that these guys cannot use a siege warfare, etc. But it, 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 part of it is true compared to, to, to the Latin Germanic war, but they were um, they were also not completely, you know, the, uh, ignorant of it. They, they displayed this capacity to even absorb uh, external communities, reinjecting, you know, and com communicating with with the east, with the 
uh, with the Caspian area, there were at this point, uh, as you know, in, at the center of a, in, uh, of a, you know, properly continental trade traffic. Think about the, the tradeways, the the Baranjats had opened the uh, trade with the great uh, Islamic uh, caliphate and this, you know, extremely wealthy, prosperous areas that, in a way, arrived. In many, you know, a branch of the Silk Road arrived straight in the Danube, in in, in Balakia, in in these areas that eventually rose up to go into Central Europe, the same Constantinople, right? The uh, the same connections between the, the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine uh, one were through through Italy, essentially, and, and the Danube, right? Think about Salzburg. Now, it develops dramatically because of salt exports to Constantinople across you know, the, the Danube, right? So, uh, the the... The Magyars are in the middle of this, and as you know, this means that you know wh whoever passes through that uh, has to pay tolls, has to, but it brings in something new, right? It enriches it, um, it, it dialogues with this reality. It makes it grow in many ways, and there are naturally many, many Westerners that are very interested about the opportunities, also that that a cons consolidation and stabilization of these peoples actually. Uh, means right. If anything, first of all, to stop the raids, but secondly, to also you know counterbalance certain other you know possible threats, right? You know, and uh, having um, if anything, having just a better defined frontier with the, the Eastern world that that literally, in fact, begins it you know with steps in, in Hungary and stretches up to Siberia, right? And and you don't know what it's coming from there, right? Literally, you know, three hundred years later, the, the the Mongols will arrive, you know, and they will overwhelm Hungary and, and stop uh, stop at the gates of, of of Germany and and Italy, and and you know, that's how close that world can arrive to, um, and this is these are thoughts and you know ideas that all bring to this general you know tendency of consolidation of of powers in this area, right, in this time. Um, and uh, because of these also plans of broader, um, you know, uh, ambitions of domination, you know, to think about the great universal policies of, of the church, of the empire, right, of the Byzantines, and, and this is all going, you know, the, the, the Magyars are going to profit from this actually pretty cleverly, but it has to pass through important internal changes with which, of course, not everybody is really, really agrees, because it entails the construction of a monarchy, which the rest of the nobility traditionally uh, rejects, right? Because who's, you know, this guy to, to rise above the others? We're, you, we're all freemen, we're all equal, we're all chieftains of, of, if not of same power, but at least of nominally, of, you know, uh, duty to be free in many ways, because otherwise we're just morality and, and our military... Uh, you know, reward of it from from the skies actually come from right. So there is a very harsh passage of 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 the the Magyars into Hungary, we would say, as a kingdom, right? Because there are also uh, rebellions against the the monarchic impositions from the within, right? Um, and uh, Blackfeld had a great importance after all from 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 this point of view, right? It's not much about, as we've seen, the, the military thing um, in, in a longer, uh, you know, in, in a broader perspective, but it's it's really about the the model that uh, mesmerizes the, the Magyars, right? This idea of saying, you know, uh, if we start imitating uh, the, 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 the Holy Roman Empire, we, we can't fundamentally carve something out on our own and we've seen actually how the uh, the, uh, the the kingdom of hungary does resemble a sort of empire on its own it's not really a kingdom proper right it, in its in its vision because this is really about what they plan to, to do in the same way right it's, it's a bit like the great bulgaria right they, they consider themselves as an empire but not as a kingdom right which is something very different for example that, that happens in the west hungary remains as a sort of a Alter ego, not of of the empire. Let's not exaggerate as you know, exactly as such, but definitely as a system that uh, maintains this unity and and an ambition and capability on its own. Because let's be honest, um, look at other powers out there like Poland. Poland manages to to achieve this 
some of this union under PS dynasty will keep ruling, but fundamentally, the the kingdom will split in so many duchies under the Piasts that you know there is not even properly a kingdom anymore. In in Hungary, this thing is said works well, right? Uh, you have since the 11th century this unitary reality that it doesn't matter how long it takes to to bring under you know all the, the various. Um, the various noblemen, the, the most powerful magnates, actually, but it, it, it transforms into something more, you know, more cohesive, right? And it also suffers pretty damn heavy blows, right, over time. Think about the, the same Mongols um, in perspective. Like, Hungary survived. It's not that the Mongols arrived. They defeat the Hungarians twice. Uh, the, the, you know, they, they are def disastrously um, beaten. But, you know, Hungary rises once again. Like in the 14th century, you look at Angev and Hungary, it's, it's, it's a hell of a power, right? Yes, there is an increase in privatization of power, the magnates take kind of more over more prerogatives. Uh, Hungary trans transitions itself into a, a, a sort of, yeah, it's a monarchic, uh, you know, in, in, uh, excuse me, elective monarchy, right, as an institutional system at the end of the Middle Ages. But up to that point, it had held fairly well, considering, you know, the precarious centralizing you know potential powers of that time right and this is this is to be acknowledged um and this is what essentially the the grand principality period um transforms in into the kingdom of hungary like like the great principality uh is this term used in historiography to define essentially the the period that goes from the settlement of the Magyars to the crowning of of saint stephen right and it is called like this because t theoretically, like these, you know, steps confederations had uh, an elective um, system of command. That is to say, you know, when wh they were at home, uh, th this was true in many ways. Even I don't know. Look at the Germanic confederations. Even during migration, it functioned fairly in the same way. Um, everybody was free theoretically all the various chieftains were free and retaining even their clanic names right and but the, the when they went to war all, they did it all together appointing this temporary chieftain uh that would lead them in a purely military function um and that however could not take over there is interestingly in in the major confederation of the 10 tribes the these two chiefs one is uh religious and another one is military and and the religious one is is obviously there like like just like in look at Slavic or, or Germanic societies uh, in pagan times, that is obviously there because religion had to control politics and to to ensure that no um, no magnate could overstep and and take over the, theoretically the freedom of the various uh, of the freemen. In fact, were better of the noblemen of of the other noblemen, and and, and this is an important uh, picture also of uh, that. Uh, that you know credits the the, the Magyars after all with a system that was able to remain together albeit it was so divided you know the, the gluing factor really was the, the military thing right you know what that the Magyars did in Central Europe during the 10th century was terrifying like what they didn't butcher or destroy uh, scorch um, set on fire right it's you know just like all the, the most extreme violence that that you can imagine uh, you know, think about it in, in this sense, because it was normal. These people were, were by the way, used to, to live on horseback, to raid as a regular, you know, uh, on a regular basis, and the same Pannonian plane at the beginning of their settlement didn't offer actually immediately, you know, the, what was built afterwards. And this is actually the interesting thing, because we can imagine that, for example, the masses of prisoners who were taken for decades within these raids had uh, integrated in Pannonia the the labor force of which the Magyars disposed in the countryside, for example, creating the um, economical conditions of, of for the survival of the dominating people and also for a more complex social stratification could culminate in an aristocracy of military chieftains settled as, let's say, as a class of great lords, right? And, and, and this is how they kind of stuck together because they managed to, to suck, let's say, all, all of these resources from, from the rest of Europe and and to build through them 
something structured and in this this work that you know if if the mergers had come in in, in other times in previous time, probably they would have not met necessarily with the same uh, you know if they had found a Charlemagne things might have gone actually in a different sense but the point is though that they managed they were extremely clever and able to to exploit the the fragmentation of the Frankish world to 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 literally ravage it for for generations and um, building at home something that could ensure them uh, you know you can imagine even the contrast in this regard internally to their society between you know the, the cons you know conservatives and those that you know were kind of more uh, progressive that to say you know yeah we have to change life so we can't continue like this we can't continue hoping that we will keep, keep raiding undisturbed and also because they were now starting to suffer their setbacks and pretty heavy defeats right so they they had to acknowledge at some point the superiority of the sedentary model that was being forced if anything because you know as soon as you settled and it's obvious that these people got softened up individually right these were individually some of you know they are warriors and the warrior is is all about its individuality of course the steps peoples had interesting levels of coordination and collective you know uh capability but of course uh the the individualistic edus was very strong and politically speaking now the, the sedentarization brings to the need of organizing something more robust at a collective level something that that really is able to to put us you know um to to stem now these powers that are starting to to actually uh, create problems like in 970 for example they were defeated by the same byzantines which is very interesting like well, after they they got defeated by the germans that they turned towards byzantines and started doing the same so they realized they tried it was evidently there the the, the the struggle between those who said no we have to continue being this fierce raiders and conquerors of the steppes and others that were more clever because civilization triumphs given the favorable conditions to look at something very very different against tradition but towards you know a better a better future um and in fact the the, the real problem here is that the, the, uh, i was explaining about the fact of the grand principality that we we don't actually get much of an evidence for because theoretically the grand prince had would have had been this guy that name at least nominally extended the uh, you know the control of the world people at least important uh, time we don't have much evidence of this right of course that the, the various chieftains were were gaining individually power on their own right as great lords um as we've seen and the arpads that had been the the leading clan right they're reading at so definitely the most powerful the most successful um and that were seeing for themselves naturally already this possibility of extending the control of, of the others uh, began to fight violently uh, against them um, uh, for the profit actually of their own clientele right that in the process was settled scattered all over the major territory under the control of the prince so naturally this is all about clientary uh, systems right there is no other way to there is no central state there are not permanent structures it's all about you know okay you're my legion and therefore you 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 obey to me now i settle here you now because here we have already destroyed someone there is around the situation is is danger so i i trust you to, to stay here naturally the thing fails again over time and that's why uh, the, during the, the time of, of of the kingdom at that point the the Arpads will actually call foreigners. We find lots of actual mercenaries that were settled eventually as Hungarian knights. I mean, to become, you know, uh, settlers and Hungarians in the long run. We're talking about people literally coming principally from Germany, uh, Italy, France, but you, you find even people from as far as from England or Spain, right? So um, that's what really makes you understand even the, the enormous potential that this area had to draw so much um uh, men and and material and resources and in ideas right to because there was evidently room to be part of a really of a great power right that we have to great give credit the majors having built once again from relatively from scratch because these areas had not been uh had not been colonized by other great powers before we are already under roman times there were you know, for fundamentally militarized frontier. There were, there were many cities. There were 
you know, well, so unproductive areas. The land is definitely not uh, great for, you know, particular just the middle Danube, it's, it's a fertile area, but, you know, the dress is actually pretty crude, um, kind of marshy. Uh, this this favored actually the entrenchment of the same people. So, like if you look at the steppes, the great rivers of uh, of Russia, the Ukraine, like you you find historically speaking that also this you know peoples of Mordy are sometimes entrenched in. Uh, think about the Zaporozhye and uh, Cossacks, right? You know, literally on islands over the of the great river. The, the 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 actually if you look at the major settlement, very often they did something similar to that. Um, and, um, and and that's that's an interesting aspect because even the process of encastellation, for example, in this um, areas, you know, ter lands entrenched but by, by, by water, right, they provided the same um, Hungarians eventually with a with solid positions, with important centers that rose up relatively out of uh, not much of a pre-existing city. Of course, like if you tell, I don't know, other think about a quincum buddha right you know this uh, roman cities but as we were saying before that they were not so much after all there was also the ultimate the struggle for the militarized frontier of the danube with the byzantines right this think about serbium think about you know the, all these areas that had always been contended in the middle danube as the key for in fact controlling those uh, river uh, routes that we were talking about before which were extremely uh, remunerative so the Arpids gradually, however, manage literally through this war, because there's not much of another way of doing it at this point, to consolidate um, this new reality, let's say to um, put in crisis the tribal system, right? And, and thanks to the new conditions of rooting in the territory and also land uh, owning, uh, manage to you know, to establish this um, ruling dynasty and also to make to, to the same, to look at the the models of, you know, political, social framing offered by the peoples that, that were scattered all around the Majors at that point. And that's where the this, there is this convergence, right, in giving uh, importance, relevance to the ecclesiastical system. Right, because the ecclesiastical system, as you know, here had always had an enormous impact in the districtuation and in the territorial control of the land, right, of, of the populations, right. If you you actually control all the various communities, you can you have a system of reference that is the one of the diocese is the one of the city, right. This is what Christianity has to offer, and you understand that this is a base. To, over which to start structuring the main. And this is exactly what happens in countries like Bohemia, uh, Poland, uh, Bulgaria, the, the, the Russia at the same time. And so it, it's literally the same, the same story. right? And it's very important here to consider that, as we were saying before, uh, the Majors were settled between this great, um, you know, these two great universal empires that were all competing with each other. Uh, and 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 the Arpeds are clever because they actually exploit both the uh, the influences. Like you know, they, they're fundamentally in harmony both with the religious missions coming from Constantinople and the ones coming from Rome. Um, and um, and they are together with them in their first success. Right? Consider that at this point the Majors were were pagan. Right? It's, it's so the, what the Arpeds do here is naturally seen as uh, like th this, these are the big magnates now. They have taken over, and they just want to have international connections and and putting the people down under them to to serve them, to maintain it, to structure their power. And therefore, there is a reaction, right? At this time, it, it, it's literally about the phase of evangelization. And uh, on the long run, the Arpeds have also to to choose on which to you know which side to support because originally speaking, it's really uh, about yeah, kind of winking at both empires and trying to play with a with a foot into um, into stirrups, let's say. But uh, on the long run, you have to to, to structure an ecclesiastical system, uh, and you have to take with you know a point of reference. So the Arpeds chose the West. The Arpeds chose Rome. They chose the Holy Roman Empire. And part of the reason might have been. 
uh, of course, the, the fascination that naturally derives with any form of defeat, like the one they had suffered from, the uh, German imperial model. Right? The, the, the trauma of Lechfeld and of the Irish battles, I mean, the, the, the Magyars understand that uh, that's, that was, uh, in a way, the, uh, the most profitable model uh, especially considering that the, the, the Byzantines are a unique power and that at some point will, they will start actually re-expanding quite dangerously their their influence on on the Danubian frontier. They will arrive up to obtain this submission of Croatia. It is an area that uh, is looked upon also by the, the you know with with uh, with great interest by the Roman papacy, but that the the Hungarians will fight to keep under their, their own control. Um, and surely they, they actually married into the Saxon dynasty. The same Stephen I was married to Gisela of Bavaria, who was the sister of Henry II, right? So um, here also the, the, the prestige of their international status is, is recognized, right? You, you, you marry the sister of the Holy Roman Emperor, so you have, um, you're recognized as a peer. In many ways, of, of course, they they recognized, you know, they calculated, uh, you know, actually the Germanic power, as we were saying before, became even a problem for the for the Magyars because at some point the the Holy Roman Empire doesn't just you know stem the the Magyar threat, but also tries to extend its control uh, over it, right, as a, as a part of its own, but it, it fails. So uh, we can't say that you know the, the the danger was less, but definitely the Holy Roman Empire had a kind of an elective nature, it was often divided, like Germany was, was not a unique bloc. Uh, they, they barely, you know, they, they, they were never unified as a monarchy. So that seemed also, you know, an area in which they, they could play more on. For example, take Bohemia and Moravia, the, you know, the, the Moravians kind of winked at the Hungars, actually they, um, they let them pass to ravage uh, Germany. And, and and even Bohemia, so much that at a certain point, you know, this brings the, the two sides together. Right? The thing actually is very complicated, but there are many tensions all over this uh, this boundary, this broader frontier that also acquires a certain specific character. It, it's probably also why you know it didn't so the development of much greater centers because this were you know between Poland, Bohemia, Austria, and Hungary, it's always been like a kind of a battlefield. It's literally, you look at the campaigns, we're <laughs> constantly saying, and raiding destructive campaigns. It wasn't much there before, to tell it, to tell it all, but uh, um, it, it at least, you know, remind kind of a militarized frontier. Um, and the, the history of the countries has always been uh, dramatically uh, intertwined. Um, and this is when, uh, in either 1000 and 1001, so in the same Actually, in the same years, for example, when Boleslav I of Poland ap appeared as cooperator imperialist, as a collaborator of the Holy Roman Empire, right? Uh, uh, especially in the that was a title given because of the ecclesiastical organization of of, of the Polish people, right? It's there uh, that um, the uh, descendant and um, uh, distant heir of Arpa himself, Stephen I, known as the Saint, was crowned as King of Hungary um, in full agreement with Pope Sylvester II, Gerbert of Aurillac, and Otto III, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. In, in this phase, we, we made videos about Sylvester II and Otto III. We have seen this dramatic impact that, that these two figures had in the history of Western civilization. I mean, they triggered the, the, the Gregorian reforms on the long run. They, they, they literally spread this broader um, awareness and conscience, uh, consciousness and, um, you know, and concreteness in the, uh, re, uh, in the functionment of, of a, univer a truly universal system. A, a, a Christian Roman one. So, uh, it, it, all of these countries, Poland, Hungary, etc., were were framed within this, right? In the broader Western, in the Roman, um, Christian, um, uh, Western world, right? You know, the um, really a, a great um, system that that pushes towards the East. We have seen how already in this centuries, actually, 
you know, there is a great at this point there's a great German migration, for example, in Hungary, like the um the disasters of the twentieth century would bring to, to much of a you know ethnic change you know, all over central and eastern Europe. But you know, the 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 the, the spread of Ger for example German communities in Hungary in places like today's Romania, etc., you know, it was of enormous uh, importance for for the same development of these countries, like all over Bohemia. Think about Bohemia, but in Hungary as well, right? You find some of these great miners, merchants, traders, were well, all Germans that were settled on purpose by the Hungarian king, right, to create basically communities that could counter the push of the local nobility, and therefore the more people you bring in to counter that, the more you can rule and play on all of them to maintain a balance. This is you know, essentially the policy of these uh, low medieval kingdoms in, in a nutshell, right? The same goes for, for the Hungarians when they settle the, the steppes, you know, refugees from, I don't know, the Mongol invasions or things like that. It's exactly the same function. It keeps going on. But um, it's important in this regard to, to, to understand also the competition that, you know, th this whole situation was militarized. There's not a single time in the Middle Ages in which you realize, you know, one, one country is doing something that has nothing to do with war uh, in it, right? Uh, Poland was, was growing as a major power now. Uh, Hungary was jealous, and, and vice versa. Bohemia was in the middle, too, was, was expanding fast, being integrated properly within the Holy Roman Empire, differently from Poland and Hungary. Um, but this two... Um, kingdoms were, however, still somewhat part of, of the West. You see, at this point, there is nothing like fully institutionalized, like nobody said, you know, Poland cannot be part of the empire. Why? Because the Holy Roman Empire is a, is a universal empire. Th theoretically, even, you know, Western Francia could be within it. Theoretically, even the Anglo-Saxons would fit on, right, you know, um, if they had, you know, if, if the West, if the emperors, if the church had claimed that, right, so it was not to exclude that Poland and Hungary could become, on the longer run, you know, maybe part of this. Of course, they would have <laughs> gladly, you know, refused, and that's in fact how it ended in the sense that, you know, that uh, the Ger the process of construction of a German national monarchy fails, right? You know, if Germany had been like France or England, you know, maybe things would have gone differently. But on the long run, you know, ED. There is a Germanization of in part of this broader area, as we've seen, but never like, a, you know, like taking over the the, the ethnic element or, you know, uh, controlling from a political institutional point of view these countries that, however, were within that orbit. It's that permeable. It's that uh, shaded in many ways. And and, and this agreement uh, with Rome definitely brought um, under Stephen. Uh, Stephen is a an, an enormous figure because he's the one that actually gives this properly political, institutional, administrative stability to the system. He's the one that cre creates the, the counties with the, the East Pons, you know, the, the, the similar to, 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 the, to the Frankish world, and it, it creates this autonomous um, uh, ecclesiastical hierarchy in Hungary that culminates with the creation of, of well, two. Uh, Hungarian metropolitic seats, right? That is not to be underestimated here. Because this meant they had basically a, an autonomy, even to, to, to evangelize, um, in, in turn, our peoples. Um, and this is kind of paradoxical, in fact, because the, the Hungarians had yet to, to, to evangelize themselves, all right? And, and this process that was promoted by, by the new king, here Stephen is literally the first king, like it's never been anything like before, so uh, a religion as it's all one with politics in this regard and, and vice versa as always right in, in the sense that you know uh, while this process of ecclesiastical st uh, structuring was happening uh, Stephen sword in hand was you know repressing with extreme uh, energy uh, the uh, you know the, the, the revolts the you know the, the attempts to, to, of being overthrown right this is as unstable as you can think and that's why this figure is so great because it actually manages to give this a firm order right consider even the territories in here uh, consider uh, you know on, on that thing we were saying before about the vastness the vastity of the of the Hungarian domain, and that you know the Pannonian Plain is fairly easy to control. It's where the dominator, the, the yeah, the conquerors had settled 
because it was like a, it's literally the step so they, they could maintain their cavalry contingents and you know starting to to raid all around but all around you have uh, you look at the Sudet and look at the Carpathians, uh, Transylvania, you know, forested areas, right? The difficult grounds. Think about the Danaric Alps. These are all very, the Alps, difficult grounds, right? And this is actually where there is also an ethnic divide because mostly these mountainous areas are inhabited by the Slavs that we know also archaeologically speaking, they had very few to do with, um, you know, with, with the culture of the conquerors, right? Because the Slavs that had settled after the, the crash of the others, you know, um, in, in the Pannonian plain, that, that now they were fundamentally majorized. I, I don't know how to, uh, to say that. Um, but culturally, of course. And the yet we see even in the equipment, we've seen it on, on the video on the um, Hungarian night, it's still, you know, in the Pannonian basin, maybe even in the 13th century, you find stuff that, you know, look at even the Hungarian nobility is still fighting with weapons of the steppes sometimes. Uh, besides the Frankish panoplies, Where, whereas the Slavs in places like Moravia or you know all around it, um, they're fundamentally still like the typical Central European, you know, equipment. It could be, I don't know, Slavic as much as Germanic, right? You know, and and that do not do not show us in terms, for example, for example, the question culture. Well. Maybe that not, but let's say that there, there is an interesting divide in this sense because the territories are different, the people are different, the the influences are different, the, the levels of economical development are different, right? Uh, where you find cavalry, there you know that there is a pretty damn advanced, um, you know, tribal economy in many ways. You know, well, you find much of the infantry at this point is usually associated with the most of the slow tribal minds, that right? Of communities that lives in 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 live in, in the woods or in, you know in the hilly areas that are not as developed as the, the ones of the, pl uh, the plains where all the trade passes, all this wealth, this circulation of people is located. So uh, no no surprise that, that there were all these um, you know difficulties on, on the long run um, that were never fully you know resolved. Right? Uh, we've seen the even the attempts of German um, political penetration and the same Hungarian uh, rebellions against the, especially the recent ecclesiastical system, right, that uh, was uh, essentially, if you look at uh, Stephen's uh, legislation, he, he was p punishing people who kept living the same old way. I mean, most, many of these people, um, especially the ruling class, were still not really have, having a semi-nomadic lifestyle but you know still retaining many customs and and laws and uh, you know and prerogatives that were different for for example think about the uh the agnatic uh system the, the agnatic seniority right of succession this idea that is typical of the steps it's not like in the west where you know there is a a male line from father to son and then all the others are gradually excluded no they, these guys think that you know if you if there is a king that has some sons, and and he dies. You know the 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 power does not pass to to, to his children, but to the, his elderly brother, right? Because the idea is that it's as if you know all who had belonged to that clan um, and that uh, generation were you know the ones who shared power, right? In that egalitarian fashion we were saying before. So actually. Uh, for for a long time would be rebellions of the same from the side of actually members of the same Arpa dynasty and all this stuff the same the same sense Stephen had had to to fight against his uncle in that regard to to rise up so this is a brutal confrontation like the is a lot of uh, bloodshed and and uh, and this naturally exposes also the the the, the same hunger to foreign intervention in a way but. It's here once again that the Arpets managed to uh, grant themselves both in front of empire and actually to the na uh, national polytheistic tradition um, their own uh, dominion, right? They, their own domination, their own authority, their own rule. Um, they they had, uh, as always, actually in the structuration of the various European kingdoms, um, the the bishops as the, their main allies in the uh, tight control 
uh, of the of the population, um, they proceeded with a political and military centralization to found a power of autocratic tendency. Right, so they don't actually abandon the idea that. Uh, there is, however, a leader in in the older fashion that has to to be um, somewhat, um, you know, the, the true warrior, like the true fighter. You only hear the, the models. Saint Stephen was educated as a pagan, right? We don't have to think that even that these these Christianizations brought to the to the sudden change. Even besides the monarchy of this, but it was an international shutout fundamentally. Um, and in the process, there is properly a territorial expansion. So this resources now that the Majors cannot take anymore from the outside, maybe but taken by uh, from the other within of what was namely there, so at least from these surrounding populations that hadn't had you know the same uh, level of development or power to be to be saved. Even some of them were pagan, actually. Um, for example, like in Transylvania. Like Transylvania is this area in which the, the Hungarians expand. It will never, you know, the, the the locals would never appreciate that quite much. If you look at the following history of the Hungarian kingdom, there is always this in, in, in near intention, um, and um, there there is the the expansion of the same Stephen, by the way, of of, um, of in, in Slovakia that that was incorporated um, in the north. And but also in the southwest towards the Adriatic Sea, that will always be one of the most important uh, aim, uh, you know, objectives of the Hungarians, because uh, naturally the wealth was there, right? In the, in the Western Mediterranean, like they they could they they reached at some point the you know uh, the, the Carpathians actually you know that, that they make all the, kind of this crescent. Right, you know, in the middle there is Transylvania. From the other side, there is uh, the, the Histria, and you know, this kind of flatland, marshland, and the Black Sea. Right, and that area is uh, like it's not particularly developed. Right, you know, there the, the were military operations on that area. There were certain facilities, etc. But it will never be as important as the cities of of, of Dalmatia or, or the, this um, lands that the Hungarians will contend to Venice at some point, remaining as a lingering, a lingering threat. Think about, you know, the, the Fourth Crusade, when the Venetians basically make the Crusaders storm Zara, that belonged at the time to, you know, to the, to the Hungarians that conquered, you know, that they re, re, re seized it like that. Um, and, um, and there is this name, namely extension, in fact, of, of, of St. Croatia and Dalmatia. And and this also creates attrition with the Roman papacy because um, the, the, the there were actually some ties of direct uh, formal and direct subordination to the papacy uh, of the so-called kingdom of Croatia Dalmatia that uh, had juridically been born under the time of Gregory the Seventh. So in a time where you know at the end of the uh, in the, in the the third fourth of the eleventh century the the church had started seeing herself as, you know, a superior authority to, to the secular ones, right? So uh, this creation uh, had been regarded as a sort of, you know, papal um, business, and, and the Hungarians came now to interfere. So this is interesting also because considered it from a, just from a geographical point, view, there is an important divide, for example, between the Balkans and uh, and Italy from one side, there is this opening of Hungary towards uh, the Germany proper and the Slavic um, world, and then in the south, this very deep from Danubian frontier with, with, with Constantinople, right? Where in the middle, there is, aside from certain military out strongholds, there isn't really much, economically speaking. That's, that's a way to, you know, basically to lure possible invasions of the enemy in this kind of no man's land where it wasn't even very easy to forage, like the, the, the Balkans, the, the Balkanic Earthland is, is a pure nightmare uh, in practice. So uh, Hungary was big and kind of framed in a bit of a even geographical dimension in so. Um, and it could therefore easily operate from, from this very center. You see there are, there's a kind of a radial intervention, right? They, they expand a bit from, from, from every side, as we were saying before, they even Across the, the the Carpathians in the northeast, in, interfering with the 
the the Kiev and Rus with the Principality of Halic, which is in today's Ukraine, right? So there is actually, and they rate actually the the the, the major rates had arrived at as deep as in, even in the east. This is often forgotten, right? We often concentrate on Germany, uh, this you know continental area like um, of of Europe, like the, that's the main target of the major rates that were devastating. But you know they they sometimes they looked once again east, right? And probably they had connections in there. I mean, they had still you know certain peoples that were you know aside from allies, but you know they were still possibly participating to their to their enterprise at the time. So um, there is this role of the uh, major kingdom that constituted, therefore, in the 12th century up to the arrival of the Mongols, the organizing force of the ethnically heterogeneous peoples settled in the great Danubian plain. Right? Let, let's see it in this way. It was really about, you know, the, the, the term of shepherds of peoples, right? Of these great peoples of the steppes, like the Abers, like even the Hans had been, that, you know, when they arrived, they settled, they, they bring with them lots of others, and they, they, are, they have this kind of imperialistic mindset, right? That they have the, the idea that they, they have to extend their empire proper over other peoples to make them work for them and to keep ravaging and fighting and, you know, expanding their dominions. Right, so here, um, Hungary is the history of a sedentarization, of a successful civilization, of the creation of permanent structures, but it's also maintaining, actually, um, a, a, a great imperialistic and, 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 and in mindset, I would say, like, a kind of a nomadic mindset, like, the, the idea of, let's say, nomadic is, is, an, is not correct, because it's not that they wanted to move anywhere else, but, but I mean, the idea that they were the great masters, the great overlords of the steppes, like that political mode of authorities really imbued with. And always and never forget in this regard that Hungary was in between, literally, because it bordered with with them, doesn't matter how you know large the frontiers were, but they were still in between two empires of theoretical universal aspirations. Right? So it was like literally between the, 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 the the greatest powers in Europe and and inspired inspired to be you know one of them at the same time also however and this is where the, the, the step element remains is that it was still a kingdom was like at, at the gates of the steps right so it was also in front of the domination of Turkic tribes that were disgregating all over the uh, the long course of the Danube, right, in this area. Think about the Pachinex and how did their stories. But, you know, th th there were all this um, blend, uh, this melange of people, right, that were sometimes even to reemerge. For example, take the, the Vlachs, right, at least with this name, right, um, that um, were the witness of a, a Latin or better Latinized population of peasants, right, dispersed uh, amongst, the, you know, the, the others, and politically submerged by these, these waves of, you know, repeated invasions, because all that area goes fundamentally from the Ukraine, where the, 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 the step is open, right, uh, but that has this corridor through Istria, through, in fact, Valachia, and then uh, from there, following the Danube up to the Pannonian Plain, is it, this corridor of 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 peoples that never ends. Like if you look at since ancient history, like you, there's never been a truly sedentary reality in, in those regions. Like even I don't know, think about the Thracians. Like the Thracians, the the, the, the ones that lived from the left bank of the Danube were horse archers fundamentally. The one in the, in the south were kind of more uh, infantry. Like and, and and this is the sedentary. And this is the, the point of the the whole story that Hungary has kind of this. Um, supply, if you want, of new force that it can in re inject constantly within itself to, to give it this boost, right? In, in, in making um, new nomadic uh, elements within Hungary and settle it to support the monarch, right? And, and, and it does both. This is the double phase of Hungary. From one side, the Frankish one, pouring uh, w Frankish knights 
all over Western, from all over Western Europe into Hungary and settled them as royal vassals to counter the ethnic nobility. From the other side, doing the same thing with, I don't know, the Kumans, with our peoples that sometimes became literally the royal army. Look at the end of the 13th century. Uh, they were even, they, they married into the Kuman, um, the Kuman nobility themselves. So the same uh, Arpadic line. So this is, um, this is very important because it, uh, it, it, it makes you realize how cleverly the, the potential deriving from both the sedentary and the nomadic world was, uh, is exemplified in Hungary. Right, there is probably no other people that um, I think achieves this with, with a greater compactness, right? It, there, there is not, objectively, because Bulgaria fundamentally it, it is crushed by, by the Byzantines at the same point. The, the, the Kievan Rus is very powerful, but it already undergoes a kind of a slow decline by the, 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 12, the 12th century. I mean, at the time of the of the Mongol invasions, it had weakened. It never had a true unity as such, right? It was namely elected the Kievan uh, prince over all the other, but in practice, they were all separate cluster, separate principalities. Poland, yeah, maintains the kingdom, but it basically, for like two centuries, it fragments itself. It's not even a kingdom anymore. Uh, the only one was Bohemia that had uh, actually a, a steady rise and a solid, but also because it was a more compact and and also kind of closer to civilization in, in many ways. So the, and it had its own important resources, etc. Even here, considered natural resources are very important in the process. And Hungary, he is, he is, um, has a lot of, uh, of, uh, of fuel, we could say. But um, in its own, uh, I mean, considering the, the times and places, uh, this is not to be given for granted at all. Like what the, the Arpads managed to achieve and definitely with important contribution of the Western intervention that helped consolidating that system, but also, you know, having this internal, uh, you know, struggle that allowed the, the, the monarchy to consolidate and to give this specific firm address was never changed, was never changed. Like, it's not other systems like, I don't know, see Lithuania. Well, Lithuania was never fully conquered, not even Christianized up to the 14th century, but, you know, that could, could swing, like, between the, uh, Russia and Poland eventually chose Poland, but you know uh, there were many other peoples that kind of either were wiped out at some point, or were crushed or re-added. Look at the Bulgarians, the, the Serbians, etc. Hungary is that thing; and it remains that thing. It doesn't matter that the Mongols arrive and and change a lot of things because, but the, the the kingdom remains what it is, right? In Russia, it wasn't like that. In Russia, the Mongol conquest changes literally everything. Um, the in Hungary, the thing holds, and this is to be given an enormous credit, uh, as much as to be credited actually uh, Hungary as a as an enormous victory of of the Roman Church, right? As um, much more than Poland properly, because Hungary was was dramatically close to the Byzantine world as well. If you look at material culture, right? In many ways, that there were many intersections there. So so. Even if uh, actually it was literally suspended between uh, east and west, you know Hungary, however, to, from a political and institutional point of view, stuck to the west, and that's that's quite of a thing. And of course, if you look at those videos in which you make the comparison with the other uh, monarchies around it, the, we talk more about, also about the low middle ages, late middle ages. So if you're interested, how to think also from a from a political institutional point of view of old like right and from a dynastic point of view it, it's there it will come back we'll come back talking about Hungary in uh, in the future again but um, for now I just hope that you stop it here so I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.